In the next seven, seven minutes, I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, our work with the Biomarkers of Aging Consortium to establish reliable biomarkers of aging for longevity intervention. And um, my name is Mahdi uh, Mokri, and I work at Stanford and Harvard and affiliated with Brigham's Hospital. So, let's see. all right. So biomarkers of aging, uh, the, the one that we are talking mostly about, the omic ones, it started with great work of uh, people like uh, Steve Horvath, uh, mostly in the epidemiology setting with uh, population health study. But uh, more and more now we are using them in basic research in Sebastiano lab, in Gladyshev lab, in different labs that are doing basic research. We are using these biomarkers to get more insight about these rejuvenation interventions that we are doing to the cells and tissues, uh, including reprogramming, uh, parabiosis, any kind of interventions. Uh, we always do uh, apply some of these biomarkers to get insight from uh, the data and understand what's happening. But uh, now even uh, clinical trials have uh, started uh, using these biomarkers in their clinical studies to get information from patients. But uh, all of these settings, uh, they always have this question which biomarkers they, need, they should to choose and how to interpret the result. So that was our motivation to start uh, thinking about how we can have some, build some consensus around what are the existing biomarkers, what does it mean, how to uh, interpret them. And the first step is we needed some scientific uh, consensus around terminologies that we are using. What is aging? That's still an open question. We have multiple competing theories of aging at the biological aging level. What does it mean to have a biomarker for aging? So we uh, thought to answer these questions, we need a panel of experts. So around uh, six months ago, more than that, now eight months ago at the Cold Spring Harbor last year with a few of the leading uh, experts in the field, we had a discussion including Steve Horvath, Mike, uh, Victoria Sebastiano, Gladyshev, a few other people, and they all agreed that we need to come together and start this uh, initiative. Uh, we call it the consortium now. And uh, we also invited uh, people from other institutes, the Buck Institute, the NIA predictive models, predictive biomarker initiatives, uh, other consortium, other clinical trials, and any labs that uh, we knew they are heavily invested in biomarkers uh, development or testing. So all in all, uh, we invited a panel of uh, 27 experts uh, uh, from basic research all the way to clinical research, and many of them have been invited to Foresight uh, to give a talk, so you are familiar with. Uh, yeah, you are familiar with a lot of them, and maybe you can invite the rest now of them I at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then uh, we came up with a consensus building uh, framework uh, based on uh, Delphi method, and we started with the literature, talk. Uh, a lot with these uh, experts one-on-one, -on -one, started drafting the first work and multiple rounds of uh, iteration until we came up with this uh, first manuscript for the purpose of uh, consensus building. So it addressed some of those uh, definitions and terminologies and frameworks. So I'm quickly going to um, just show you a few uh, pieces from this work. It took us, uh, the, the hardest part was that we spent three months to agree uh, how to define aging and how to define biological aging. That was... Exactly, yeah. And that was the hardest part and that's the, the part that we didn't reach an agreement. But uh, <laughs> we needed to write a paper so people had to... Uh, this is the definition that uh, people hate the least uh, and uh, they can live by. So we don't have time to get into it, but uh, some of this is on our website. I'll uh, share the website with you. The next was uh, what are different kinds of biomarkers uh, based on uh, the FDA framework. We extended that uh, for our context. Now we have predictive biomarkers versus response biomarkers. And the goal is uh, one day to have a surrogate endpoint biomarkers that uh, respond to intervention and also predict health outcome, as, as in the, and it is in the causal pathway of these uh, this relations. So it's still, we don't have that. Uh, Jamie Justice has a really good paper on that. But um, what else we did is we put together the existing biomarkers that have been licensed and are being uh, uh, commercially used, uh, including different omics, uh, 
And uh, the other thing is the biomarkers that have been used in clinical trials or being used in clinical trials. So it was uh, surprising how many of these biomarkers, and these are just epigenetic biomarkers that, have been, that, are, that are being or have been used in uh, clinical trial studies. And just more and more, uh, it's becoming uh, more common. Uh, the uh, other thing is some of these uh, concerns about uh, <coughs> the relation between GERP protectors and biomarkers. We still don't have validated therapeutic GERP protectors uh, in a sense, and we still don't have validated biomarkers of aging and how these, uh, these connect. So some of these conceptual uh, concerns that we, uh, we are able to discuss with the panel of experts and we have our opinions, uh, our consensus uh, uh, opinions and the state of field reflected in this manuscript. And uh, one thing that I wanted to maybe uh, talk about here is what we are doing right now uh, based on one of the uh, findings of our first work. So the first work is done, it's now under review uh, in a high impact journal, hopefully it comes out soon. Uh, the abstract is on the website, I'll share that. Uh, but right now what we are working is the uh, validation problem, how we can um, validate a biomarker of aging using population studies. So we already have uh, an ongoing effort using uh, a lot of uh, cohort study and now biobanks are joining this effort. But the idea is a lot of uh, first generation, let's call them first generation biomarkers, they were just predictor of age, like including uh, Horvath 2013 peri paper, uh, the first epigenetic clock, uh, one of the first uh, was a uh, really good correlate uh, and predictive of the age of the person. So they are really good for a lot of applications, including forensic. But what we care about is uh, a biomarker that correlates well with the aging outcome, including mortality, uh, healthy longevity, and all other outcome. And for this, we invited an additional cohort of experts working on cohorts and biobanks. And uh, we are having a symposium in December 4th, and we are going to talk about that. So it's a good time for me to maybe thank uh, the scientific committee including uh, Michael Snyder and Vittorio and others, and uh, Allison and Dane who helped us to put this together, and uh, all the labs that, I, uh, that I'm affiliated with for their help and support and flexibility. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, you have hands up already. Carl, go for it. Yeah, um, yes please. I love biomarkers, um, so glad this is going. Um, most of what you talked about was sort of top-down, like biomarker of overall biological age kind of stuff. Is the various expert committees, there's lots of people involved in this effort, is anybody thinking about biomarkers at a more granular or a bottom-up level? Um, like I'm particularly interested in biomarkers that track the presumed mechanism of action of geroprotectors. So not necessarily things to measure the overall biological state that you would then be able to screen from, but you know things to track, is the MOA working the way we think it is? And how do we screen which geroprotector is appropriate for which subset of the population based on their th those particular markers, for example? Yeah, so uh, that kind of uh, application of biomarkers, so biomarkers have a very broad applications from biomarkers of diseases to biomarkers of health to now we are trying to com merge biomarkers concept with aging. So it's a whole new area for biomarkers. But uh, within that, uh, we have identified this response biomarkers that now are being adopted by a lot of commercial entities, including in silico medicine and others. And uh, the idea is how to use this for screen uh, to screen drug. And uh, it's a bit commercial space, so we don't have as uh, much information like other fields. Uh, for scientific uh, exploration. But Alex Jovorankov is uh, one of our uh, members on the panel of experts, and uh, he added some content on that regarding to how these biomarkers could be used to screen drugs. But uh, not much, I don't see much, yeah, much on that. Yes? Do you have an explicit mapping component of this that looks at the validated relationships between, say, these biomarkers and mice? the biomarkers in people? Yeah, so that, uh, and so validation is still another broad area. So in regard to that, we are 
we, we look at cross-species validation, and that was the point that Steve really helped with that, with this first work. And uh, first of all, is it a good thing to have a biomarker that you could validate across a species? So that talks about uh, conservation of that mechanism that, hap that happens uh, across mammals. But then there are other people uh, that discuss that might not be relevant because biology and complexity. So 